Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall be of my heart. And the ladies. Hold 
so lost till I fell at the cross and God said, oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How good. of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. I got Jesus. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of
right, grab your Bibles, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Colossians. Colossians in your New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter number one. We're going to try to wrap up this series on what's new. What's new? How many of y'all are glad when you came to Jesus, things are brand new? Things are brand new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. New, new, new. What is new? If there's nothing new in your life, you might want to see if you got the real deal. Let me say that again. Y'all wasn't paying attention. If things are not new in your life after you claim to have been saved, uh, you might want to check up because when Jesus comes in, when he comes in, he does a work. The first, the first uh, message in this series was Easter Sunday, and we learned we have a new covenant. Amen? A new covenant. Then last week, we learned that we have a new life. We have a new life. It is impossible to keep living the old life because your old man is dead. dead. He died. Supernaturally, the Holy Spirit took him back to Calvary, crucified him on a cross. We buried him in baptism. And now you're raised to walk in the newness. Say it with me. In the, the newness of life. How many of y'all are glad you have a new life? Amen. Now, today we're going to try to wrap this up. We're going to try to wrap this up and preach on the subject uh, because there is a new covenant which gives us a new life, thank God we have a new future. A new future. Look in Colossians chapter number 1. If you found your spot, say amen. amen. Verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Emphasis on the word Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind, Lord is not his name. Lord is his title. Jesus is his name. Lord is his title. Lord is the, is the Greek word kurios, which is the word meaning supreme in authority. He is our Lord. He's our king. He's our supreme authority. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you, and as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. I, that, that's another proof that once you get saved, there's going to be some fruit. There's going to be some evidence of a change. Now, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is, in, or who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. So, so far, Paul is saying, we heard that you have accepted Christ and you're following the Lord and there's fruit, there's evidence of that conversion. And for this cause, Paul says, for this reason, since the day we heard it, heard what? That they had trusted Christ, that they are now Christ followers, that they are in the way. He said, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his. Oh, boy. Paul said the most important thing you can know is God's will for your life. And so since the day I heard that you were saved, I've been praying that you would know God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all might. See, all this comes with being in the will of God. Walking worthy, being pleasing, 
being fruitful, increasing in knowledge, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering and joyfulness. How many of y'all need some of that stuff? Yeah. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, M-E-E-T. The word meet there means qualified. He has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So we have in verse 5, we have a hope that is laid up for us in. And now in verse 12, we have been qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Listen, verse 13, I love it. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the... Everybody real loud. Fair of you, I want to hear you all the way over here. You ready? He has translated us into the kingdom. kingdom of his dear son. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house. Lord, we don't deserve any of this, but we are so thankful. And God, we give you glory and praise and honor. Uh, Lord, you are the only one worthy to receive it. God, there's no celebrities in this house. We're all servants of King Jesus. And God, I pray that you'll please help me. Let me remember the things I've studied. Let me remember the things I've learned so that I can encourage your people, so I can edify your children today. Lord, we will love you and we will thank you and we will glorify you. Thank you so much for what you've already done. And God, we'll, we'll be careful, careful to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to I wanna give you just two points today. Uh, seems like last couple of weeks I've been going really over time. So we're going to cut back just a little bit, kind of, and do the best we can. And tell them to work that clock right. Say amen. Uh, uh, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, when we got saved, everything changed. Everything changed. See, before I was saved, I was in a different kingdom. Before I was saved, I was under the power of darkness. The Bible says we were children of wrath, according to the book of Ephesians, dead in our trespasses and in sins. But when we come to Christ, We've been made alive, and we are now partakers of the inheritance in life. I am a new creature, I have a new song, and I have a new future. A new future. Now, that, that new future, and, and I'm not just going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the, the, the sweet by and by. We're going to get to that at the end, but, but I want to talk about my new future, not just here on earth, but also in heaven. But let's start with here on earth. Now, how many of y'all know that when you got saved, God left you here? Now think about that. That's not hard to imagine. You're here. You're looking at me, all right? I, I, think, I think sometimes I really feel like the Apostle Paul where he says, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. It would be far better to be walking streets of gold. It would be far better to be basking in the glory of his presence. It would be far better to be joining the angels and singing glory and praise and honor yeah. unto the heavenly king. But right now, it's better, Paul says, for us to be here. We need to be here. We've got a destiny. We've got a job to do. So here's what I want to do. I want to talk about two things, really, two things. Uh, when it comes to our future, when it comes to our future, this new future that we have since we come to Christ. And, and Paul, he explains this in, in Colossians chapter number one. First of all, uh, if you're taking notes, write this down. We have a new destiny. A new destiny. My purpose has changed. My purpose has changed. That's what the word destiny is. It's my purpose. It's a, 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 a reason for living, if you will. I, I was listening, I, for some reason, I couldn't sleep last night, and uh, I was flipping through the channels, and I come across, I come across a channel, uh, and, the, and, the, and the documentary was Elvis and the Memphis Mafia. 
Now, don't judge me. I like Elvis, all right? I can't help it. I, I just, I, there ain't nobody in this world can sing uh, uh, How Great Thou Art or There'll Be Peace in the Valley like Elvis Aaron Presley. Amen. And, and, but anyway, anyway, he, his is a sad story. I, I was listening and, and, and he heard about a hairdresser, a, a, a guy, uh, which I, I don't call a guy a hairdresser. He's a barber. Say amen. Anyway, this, he, he heard about this guy who was doing all the star's hair and all that, and he wanted him to come and, and do his hair. And so he invited him over, and, and so they start talking. And this guy's like a new age guy. Uh, 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 he, he, he studied all the world's religions and all. He's supposed to be really read up, and he's all. And man, that just intrigued Elvis. And they begin to talk, and he said, well, listen, I don't mean to bore you. And Elvis said, no, 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 I want to hear this. I know, I know there's a purpose for living. I just don't know what that is. I know I am here. Out of all the means, why did I, I why am I the one that's, and he just kept on going. And, 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 and then this guy started talking like he was smart and everything, and, and I'm like, you, this is so sad. He, he is so full of the world's religions and the world's cults, and he is so deceived, one, it is the blind leading the blind. And I wanted to, I was just sitting in the bed looking at that and wondering, man, I wish I could go back into time and go into that room and sit with both of them and say, you're both wrong. Let me tell you what the real deal is. There is a real God. There is a real king. His name is Jesus. And your life will never be right till you are in the kingdom of God, following King Jesus, fulfilling the purpose and the will that he has for your life. Pills will not satisfy you. Fame will not satisfy you. Money will not satisfy you. The things of this world cannot satisfy you. You have a new destiny. It's just like the it's just like the the the, the disciples when they begin to follow Jesus. You remember you remember what he told them. He, remember what he told them after he got out of the boat. He said, "Listen, I want you to follow me, and I will make you to become." Their destiny changed. Their destiny at one time was to work the nets and work the, their father's business and to be fishermen that fishes for fish. But then they met the master. They met Jesus Christ, and Jesus changed their destiny. He changed their outlook on life. He changed their future. He changed their purpose, their purpose. Now, see, I want to give you three things underneath purpose. Here's our, here's our new destiny, guys, and if you're saved, you have a new purpose. You have a new destiny. First of all, what is our destiny? What is our purpose in life now that we have come to Christ? The Bible says in that last verse we read, he has translated us from the power of darkness into the, say it with me, into the kingdom. See, y'all didn't even pay attention when I read that verse. Look what it says, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom. kingdom. Into the kingdom. Say that with me. Into the kingdom, kingdom of his dear Son. Now, if it's the Son's kingdom, that means He's the King. Right? If He is the owner, if He is the supreme, He is the authority, He is the King of His kingdom. And when you got saved, you were put in a kingdom. In a kingdom. Now, what, what are we talking about a kingdom here? Well, the definition of this word the definition of this word is this, the sphere of God's what? Rule. The sphere of God's rule. The kingdom of God is the sphere in which at any given time his rule is acknowledged. All right? So it's the rule of God, the realm, the people. All right, the people that he is reigning over, the people that he is ruling over. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, it's not necessarily talking about a geographical region, although there is coming a day when he will step foot on this earth and his millennial kingdom will begin for, and it'll last a thousand years on this earth, but that's not what he's talking about right here. 
It's not the physical kingdom on this earth. It's the spiritual kingdom in his believer. Now watch this. You, I don't think you have this on your notes, but in Luke 17, Luke 17 verse 20, the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus and, and they say, when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is what? Within it's within you. It's not going to be over here or over yonder. It's in you. The rule is in you. The spirit is ruling over you, reigning over you, leading you, guiding you, directing you. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. That's what he's talking about. God has a kingdom. You are in the spiritual kingdom of God. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of God and our king is the Lord Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. Now here's three things about this kingdom I want you to write down. Here's our new destiny. Here's our new future. Here's our new purpose. I am, I am destined. I am purposed. I am designed. That's why God recreated you on the inside and you are a new creature. You were created after his image and unto good works so you could do this. First of all, God wants you to pursue this kingdom. Write that down. He wants you to pursue this kingdom. What does he say? He says, seek ye. Now that means... This pursuit is your priority. Think about that a minute. Everybody look at me now. Come on, come on. This is going to be tough to hear. But the pursuit of his kingdom is to be your priority in life. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now in that chapter, he's talking about what the Gentiles are seeking after, what their priority is. Their priority is money. Their priority is possession. Their priority is the clothes on their back and the food on their table. Their priority is all that the world is offering. And what God is saying to you, don't worry about the clothes on your back. Don't worry about the food on your table. Don't worry about your physical needs. Don't worry about your material needs. I will take care of all that. I want you to seek my kingdom. I want you to pursue my reign. I want you to pursue and go after my rule in your life. How many of us are living our life with no, I mean not even a hint of, of, of question or wonder about God's kingdom. We're just going about living our life not even caring about what God is wanting you to do or be. His kingdom is not your priority. Your hobbies and your, your playthings and your toys and, and your habits and, and all these things. Listen, that should not be our, there's nothing wrong with those things. As long as he is priority, you can have stuff and you can go places and you can do things. But is his kingdom your priority? Seek ye the kingdom. Now how do we do that? It's very simple. He made it easy. When they asked him to teach us to pray, here's what he said. Here's what he said. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy and there it is. Now we know, we know when he says thy kingdom come, there is a, there is a hint there that we're seeking his literal, physical kingdom here on this earth. And we're wanting him to come. All right, listen, our spirit's crying out, oh, come Lord Jesus. I'm tired of Democrats and Republicans. I'm looking for King Jesus. I'm tired of the dictators of this world causing wars and causing problems and causing famine and killing people and all of this. Man, come Prince of Peace. But it's specifically saying your kingdom come. God, I want you to rule my life today. I want you to rule my steps today. God, I want you to rule my words today. I want to do what my king wants me to do. I want to be what my king wants me to be. I want to go where my king wants me to go. I want to be totally obedient to the word and direction of my king. That's what that means. Are you pursuing his kingdom? Or are you pursuing your kingdom? 
And see, that's where a lot of, that's where a lot of pastors are having problems. They're so busy building their own kingdom, they have no concept of his kingdom. Anyway, that's a whole nother, I can't even get into that right now. Just get me out in the flesh, sure enough. <laughs> Listen, are you pursuing his kingdom? Do you consistently, do you consistently wake up in the morning and say, King Jesus, here I am. What would you have me to do? Pursue his kingdom. Not only pursue, our destiny is to pursue his kingdom. Our destiny is to promote his kingdom. Write that down. Our, our, our destiny is to promote his kingdom, his rule, his reign. Watch what it says. Watch what it says. We got different people here. Jesus, Philip, and Paul. Jesus in Acts 1-3. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Acts eight twelve. Philip. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. Acts 19, 8. Here's Paul. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing, persuading the things concerning Acts 28, 30, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came unto him, preaching and teaching those things which concerned the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. So in Acts 1, they're speaking the kingdom of God. They're, and In and, and Acts 8, they are preaching the kingdom of God. In Acts 19, they're disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom. In Acts 28, he's preaching to whoever would listen the kingdom of God. Preacher, how do we, how do we promote the kingdom of God? Well, by your lifestyle, by your language, and by your leading. Now, everybody look at me just a second. Do the people around you, do they have to wonder who your king is? Is your life showing evidence that Jesus is your king? Does your language reflect the kingdom? Does your lifestyle reflect and promote the kingdom? Do people, do you have to tell people you're a Christian? Are you promoting the kingdom? Are you advancing the kingdom? Do people see kingdom ways in you? Do people see a kingdom lifestyle in you? Do they see a citizen that is submitted and surrendered and committed and loving their King, are you promoting the kingdom? You see, we're supposed to be pursuing it. Now, it's going to be hard to promote it if you're not pursuing it. Now, now let's think about this now. Let's stay, let's stay in Colossians. What did he say? What did Paul say? From the moment, I mean the very moment that I heard about your salvation, about you being translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the moment I heard that, I've been praying without ceasing that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will. Now why? So you could pursue the kingdom. So you could seek after what he wants you to do, seeking his will, seeking his direction, seeking his plan for your life. There's way too many Christians who have this idea that God has a will for the preacher or the missionary or the evangelist. He's got callings for them. Are you kidding me? We're all in the kingdom. We all have a responsibility to our king. We all have jobs to do given to us. He said, walk worthy of the vocation wherein with ye are called. Are you pursuing the kingdom? Are you seeking his will? Do you wake up in the morning and say, thy will be done. Thy will be done. Seeking him. Listening for his direction. Listening, submitting. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, guys. It means to submit to him. Whatever you want, Lord, I'm here. Fill me, guide me, control me. My words, my thoughts, my actions, they are yours. You are my 
king. I'm to promote this kingdom. I'm to live my life in such a way that it reflects on the kingdom. Are y'all with me? So A, A, our destiny first is to what? Pursue the kingdom. Then we are to? Promote the kingdom. Now look here. Look here. See, write this down. It's my job to populate the kingdom. It's my job to populate the kingdom. Look what it says. In Luke 14, in Luke 14, verse 15, somebody brought up the kingdom to Jesus. And so he begins to explain to them what the kingdom's like. It says, when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, that reference was to the future kingdom. The one that the Jews thought was coming right then. The, the physical, literal reign of King Jesus on this earth. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I cannot go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another, I look, this is my favorite one. Dude didn't even make an excuse. I married a wife, and I can't come. <laughs> my soul, what truth in that verse, amen? I, I just can't, I ain't gonna make those, I just can't come. So, <laughs> anyway, and all God's people said, so that, <laughs> so that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Watch what the master of the house, the king of the kingdom. The master of the house being angry said to his servant, go out, come on, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. In other words, everybody that nobody won't. The outcast. Listen. He says, and the servant said, It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. Aren't y'all glad there's still room? Yes. There is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and... Yes. Say it with me. And... Compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Preacher, what are you saying? I can take from this chapter that God's desire is to fill his kingdom. And the way he's going to fill his kingdom is through his kingdom servants. They are to go out into the highways and hedges. They're to go out into the lanes and the streets of the city. They're to go and reach people and tell people and compel people. My father used to say, compel means to hog time, drag, whatever it takes. Get, get them here. I want my house to be filled. Are you populating the kingdom? Are you taking active steps to try to populate the kingdom of God? Are you sharing your faith? Are you telling people about Jesus? When's the last time somebody came to Christ because of the efforts that you have made? When's the last time you opened up and spoke and said, please come sit with me in church? Listen, if you're not going to share your faith, at least come invite them to hear it. It's my job to populate the kingdom now. That's my destiny. That's my calling. That's your calling too. Hello. Well, I don't know what God's will is. Well, let's see. He, he told us, go ye in all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Go ye and make disciples. Well, you know that. Are you doing that? Has it ever dawned on you? Has it ever dawned on you the only thing you can take to heaven is somebody else? That house, that car, those toys, they're all going to burn up. The Bible says they're going to melt with fervent heat. And the only thing we can take to heaven with us is someone else. 
Are you actively involved in populating the kingdom? You see, that's why we're doing this, these church boxes. A wise man told me a long time ago, and I had to get this figured out. My kingdom, unfortunately, in my mind, and this was, this was very immature of me, for a long time was these four walls. These four walls. I was doing everything I could to fill these four walls. My focus was not on the kingdom. It was my kingdom. And then when some great men of God helped me understand, my job is not to fill these four walls. That's not the extent of my vision. If that's the extent of your vision, your vision is flawed. My vision is to populate the kingdom in Coleman, in Hartzell, in uh, uh, Addison, and all these places. I just flew to Chicago. Just flew to Chicago. Was there. Flew Thursday. Uh, uh, got up there in the tiniest plane you ever imagined. Oh, my soul. I got on that plane and almost fired Dustin on the spot. <laughs> Man, it was tiny. Me, me and, me and uh, uh, Julio over there, Cesar, we went, to, uh, we went to Chicago and met with the sweetest Hispanic group up there. And, and, and we believe we're going to be able to get a Hispanic training center started up there, DMD, Disciple Making Disciples group up there. We were able to make contacts in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. How many of y'all know Yankees need the Lord? You don't believe it? Go stay up there a little bit. Do you know they need Jesus? Amen. What are you doing? I'm populating the kingdom. Your vision cannot be these four walls. Your vision needs to be your state. It needs to be your country. It needs to be your continent. It needs to be your world. It needs to be Africa. It needs to be the Sudan. It needs to be Muslim countries who are so far away from God. That's the kingdom. God, our king, deserves glory from every nation. Why are you doing all this? Why are we planting churches? Because we're kingdom-minded. It's about the kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. Listen. I'm going to say something, and it's going to get around because I know they watch. There was churches that heard that I apologize to somebody online. It was spreading around churches here in Coleman before the second service ever even started. So that means they watching. Yeah. And good, I want you to watch. Boy, <laughs> I almost said something bad. I almost said something bad. Do you know why there's so much competition in Coleman? There's so much competition in Coleman. Amongst churches. We are the enemy to a lot of churches. We have tried our best to uh, offer uh, conferences and, and training uh, to, to help them fill their buildings. But they see us as competition, as the enemy. You may tell you why? They're not kingdom minded. I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to get people out of their churches. I'm trying to get people in their churches. Listen, we, we have invited uh, several pastors from this area to help them and encourage them and bless them. Why? It's about the kingdom. It's not about Temple Baptist Church. Listen, it's not, it's not, if our mindset is so focused on Temple Baptist Church, you don't have a kingdom mindset. We can't, do y'all know we can't fit 80,000 people in this building? So if we don't help other churches reach people for the kingdom, they're not going to get reached because they all can't fit in here. So we can't be just focused on our place. We have to be kingdom minded. Not temple church minded. Does this make sense? I get questions all the time. Well, why are we sending money here or sending money there? Or why are we trying to do this? Why don't we? Because we're kingdom minded. We're pursuing a kingdom. We're trying to populate a kingdom. Are y'all with me? Say amen. amen. And by the way, let me just say this. Let me just throw this out there just for you critics in here. The more effort. And I was told this. I was told this. Probably the best missions pastor I know taught me this. If you will focus on the kingdom, God will focus on this place. And do you know what's happened? 
Do you know what's happened? We have given through your generosity probably, well, I, I'm not going to, I'm just saying a ton, way more than probably a lot of places. But you know what God's done for here? He has blessed this place incredibly. Incredibly. You know why? God said, you take care of my kingdom, I'll take care of yours. And he has. Preacher, what's our new destiny? We're to pursue a kingdom. We're to promote a kingdom. We're to populate a kingdom. Say that with me, those three things. We're to be Pursue, I say it and you say it. Pursue a kingdom and there you go. All right. Give yourself a hand. Give yourself a hand. All right. Now, here we go. What was, what was number one? What was number one? A new future. We have a new now. We have a new B, or number two, write this down. We have a new destination. We have a new de Well, what was my old destination? You don't want to know. How many of y'all know we were all destined for hell? The moment we were born, David said in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born a sinner. And because I was born a sinner, death came by sin. The wages of sin is death. And because of that sin of Adam, sin and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I was on my way to hell. That was my destination. Condemnation was my destination. But the day I got saved, I got a ticket to a different place. Are y'all with me? Where do we find that in Colossians? Let's do it quick. Let's do it quick. Look in verse 5. Look in verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Then look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. You see, that's our new destination. My favorite verse in the Bible. I'll usually share it at a funeral. And help them understand, if this person is a child of God that's laying here in front of us, this is not the end. This is not the end. Matter of fact, it's just the beginning. And then I'll quote John 14. John 14 is probably my favorite verses in the Bible. But really, to, to get all the goody out of John 14, you got to read John 13. And in John 13, we find that Jesus just got through telling his disciples that he was going to leave. This man who they'd been following for three years, who gave up everything and sacrificed everything and left everything to follow Jesus, now he said, I'm going to die and go back to be with my father. I've got to leave. Man, they were tore out the frame. They were so upset. Now, what in the world? What is going on? What do you mean you're leaving? The one who healed them when they were sick, the one who fed them when they were hungry, the one who calmed them when they were afraid, the one who met every need that they had, taught them all that he's leaving? And then Jesus says these words. Hey, 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 hey. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. You see, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Are y'all with me? I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Preacher, what are you saying? You see, he calmed them by telling them of a place, a wonderful place. First of all, if you're taking notes, write this real quick. Just write these things down. We've got six minutes to finish this. It is a prepared place. It is a prepared place. Now, now I'm not talking about any of the contractors around here. We're not, we're not talking about MP construction. <clears throat> That's Mark Powell, by the way. 
Mark Powell, he can build some of the, the, the most gorgeous things. Half that's, well, about all, all the stuff out here, the, 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 the new uh, area, the Connect Center out there, Mark did. Our, our church over here, uh, uh, Mark put all that together. Man, I, I said, Mark, I just need a little silhouette of a cabin, and he built a whole cabin on a stage one time. A whole pirate ship, if you missed all them things out. I, I mean, does incredible work. He, he built one of the sweetest coffins I've ever seen that looked like a hope chest. And man, that's exactly what that was. Unbelievable. But we're not talking about people with incredible skills here. I'm talking about the designer of the Great Barrier Reef. I'm talking about the designer who scooped out with his own hand uh, uh, the Grand Canyon and Mount Everest, the one who flung the stars out in the sky, the one who set the sun right where it needed to be, the one who got the earth spinning at just the right speed we wouldn't fly off, and the one who put us at the right, I mean just the right distance from the sun that we don't burn up and we don't freeze to death. The architect of the universe is preparing you a place. He's preparing you a place. Now listen, it's a prepared place, but it's a personal place. Write that down. It's a personal place. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Can you imagine? Everybody likes different stuff. Everybody likes different stuff. Some people like the... The, the, the farm look, and some people like the retro look, some people like all these different looks, some people like shiplap, which is of the devil, say man. <laughs> I wish, I w- mm. all these TV shows are of Satan. <laughs> Our spouses watch this stuff and get ideas that they shouldn't have. I need a witness, men. If you are a man and you didn't say man, you're a coward. You know I'm right. You know I'm telling the truth. But we do, don't we? Some people like brick. Some people like stucco. Some people like siding. You know, uh, we, we, we have all these different, but God knows, listen, he knows you so well, he knows every hair on your head. And he's preparing you a place just for you. Specifically, the God of glory, the God of this universe is preparing you a place. Not y'all, you. Sometimes we look at God as this God of everybody, but he is the God of everybody, but he's the God of you. He's a personal God. And he's preparing you a place. If, If you're in the kingdom, if you're in the kingdom. But here's my favorite part. I found this over in Revelation. I don't know about y'all, but I hate pain. I hate brokenness. The worst part of ministry and being a pastor is having to do funerals. Because you want so bad to take all their pain away. And, and you wish you had a magic wand that you could just wave it and, and everybody's better and everybody's healed and everybody's comforted. But this, in this broken, cursed world we're in, that's just not reality. As long as we're in this world, there's going to be hurt and there's going to be pain and there's going to be brokenness. There's going to be death and there's going to be sickness and there's going to be heartache. But guys, let's finish this off. Let's finish this whole series off with these verses. Revelation 21, 5, 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. You know how... A bride is so decked out and beautiful. God's going to have that city decked out and beautiful waiting on us. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Read it with me. 
And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more, neither, nor, neither shall there be any more, for the former things are passed away. Watch this. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I make all things new. The one on the throne is the king. And your king, look at me everybody, we'll, we'll close. Your king said, there's coming a day. I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth because this earth here is broken. This earth here is cursed. This earth here is full of sorrow and heartbreak. And sin. But there's coming a day. I'm going to make a new one. A new one that doesn't have any sin. A new one that doesn't have any curse. A new one that doesn't have any pain. A new one that doesn't have any sorrow. A new one that doesn't have any tears. And more specifically, a new one that has no dying. And no more death. Ladies and gentlemen... God made a new covenant, and he's given us a new life so we could have a new destination. If you don't know him today, if you're not in his kingdom, if you're not 100% sure if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven. I want to help you today. I want to I wanna bring a new citizen into the kingdom. And you could take today, take today, and become a citizen of the kingdom of God. And all God's people say it. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to please touch any person in here that's not saved. Touch any person in here that's under conviction right now that you are drawing. Lord, that you are convicting right now. Lord, they don't have to die and go to hell. I know right now their present destination is eternal flames and eternal sorrow, eternal suffering, and eternal torture in hell. But God, their destination can change. There is a place that Jesus will prepare for them if they will come and acknowledge his lordship. They will confess him king, submit to his kingship, Believe on him with all their heart. I pray today will be that day. In Jesus' name, every head bowed and every eye closed. You at Fairview, you bow your head and close your eyes. I want to tell you something. If you're in this building or if you're at Fairview right now and God is dealing with your heart, you say, preacher, the truth be known, I'm not 100% sure if I was to die right now, I'd go to heaven. I just don't know. I, I want to I make sure you can say for sure. And if you're in this building or at Fairview, you say, preacher, I don't want to die and go to hell. I want Jesus to be my king. Here's how that happens. According to Romans chapter number 3, you've got to understand that you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Sin has to be paid for. It has to be paid for. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says in, in, in <laughs> Romans, that God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid that debt. He paid the price for sin. You say, well, how do, I, how do I get that payment? He said in Romans 10, 9 and 10, If thou wilt confess the Lord Jesus and believe with all your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Preacher, what does that mean? If you'll with your heart right now pray and believe with your heart that Jesus is God's Son, God raised Him from the dead, and He's alive today. If you will confess Him, Lord, and believe in your heart, God will save you today. And if you're ready to do that, I want to lead you in a prayer. It's what you're doing with your heart. You say, preacher, I want that in my life. I want it today. Well, if you'll believe in your heart, pray this prayer with me. And, and just speak like you're speaking directly to Jesus himself. Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And the best I know how, I ask you now to forgive me. I ask you now to forgive me and to save me. Forgive me and save me. I believe that Jesus died and rose again. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save me. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.